watching Talking Point on Stat News Global. I'm Amit Abrain. It's great to see from Amritsar, Ambassador Navdeep Singh Suri. In the context of this discussion, he's in India's last ambassador to the UAE and is currently a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Thanks for your time, Ambassador. Pleasure. Also from the capital is uh, Dr. Meena Singh Roy, and she was the ex head of the West Asia Center at the Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Strategy and Analysis, and is currently a distinguished fellow at the Mid East uh, Institute. Dr. Roy, thanks so much. Uh, you know, you tried to beat the protest by getting from Pakistan to Delhi. Thank God you got it uh, here in time. Thanks for your time. Pleasure. Pleasure to be with all of you. Ambassador Suri, uh, the latest news pick, if I put it like that, is the Indian Army Chief, General M. Narawane, is he's in the UAE, he's going to Saudi Arabia. How significant do you see this visit of uh, the Indian Army Chief uh, to both those countries in terms of the geopolitical churn that's happening in the region? Well, I think it's part of the uh, uh, process that we've had in uh, place since uh, almost the last four years to reinvigorate our relationship with key countries in the Gulf. Um, and I must say that it's something that has paid us exceptional dividends in terms of our foreign policy outreach. Uh, you know, uh, having served in, the, in, in Abu Dhabi um, at, a, at a time when the relationship was really on the upswing, you know, my predecessors would often lament the fact uh, that for a country that is our near neighborhood, um, we spent 34 years from 1981 to 2015 without a prime ministerial visit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so, you know, before Prime Minister Modi came uh, in 2015, the last visit uh, was Mrs. Gandhi. Um, and, and since then, Mr. Modi has gone back twice. Uh, so three visits to UAE, a visit to every single capital in the uh, uh, in the in the Gulf region, um, and and really uh, an effort to make up for lost time. Now, General Narwana's visit come, is to me important for two or three specific reasons. Number one, um, we've been uh, upping the ante in terms of our defense cooperation. Uh, the Emiratis are very keen uh, for defense cooperation with us. We had our first bilateral maritime exercises uh, with them. Um, and, and you know, uh, many of us don't realize that in military terms, the UAE army really does punch above its weight. Um, and they've got some of the finest hardware, etc. Uh, and they are keen to talk to us about uh, defense co-production. They are keen to talk to us about strategic areas of cooperation, uh, which uh, would have been unthinkable a few years back. The other important aspect is for all the civilian visits that we have, all the uh, uh, ministers that come and go uh, uh, between Abu Dhabi and Delhi, there's a certain value in a uniformed person, the head of our armed forces, to come. Because remember, say Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the uh, acting sort of de facto ruler of UAE, um, was head of the armed forces before uh, he took up his current position. So there's a, a, a kind of an automatic connect. And, and remember, this is a place that we would always cede to the Pakistanis, for example, who would trot out uh, their army chiefs and the ISI uh, chiefs for um, um, high level dialogues. And they would get access to the top leadership. Um, I think what we've managed to do is not only elbow Pakistan out of the equation uh, in, in, in some of these countries, uh, but really expand our own strategic space. Uh, the foreign minister, uh, Mr. J Dr. Jayashankar, was in uh, Abu Dhabi uh, uh, 10 days back, and now the army chief is there. I, I think this is a very important signal of the importance that we now attach to this relationship. The importance, uh, Dr. Roy, if I can get you just on the military strategic importance, and I'm not hyphenating India or Pakistan in any sense, but looking further, just about, uh, I would say, maybe three months back when I interviewed the Russian Deputy Chief of Mission here, Raman Babushkin, he was talking about uh, just the last bureaucratic clearances left, say, for the Brahmos. 
to be exported to third countries. They expected it during the summit with the President Putin. We don't know when that will happen. And he specifically mentioned, apart from Southeast Asia, which we know, ASEAN, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, possibly, he mentioned South America and he mentioned the Gulf as well, which had approached for that. Do you think something as significant as that, maybe not in this visit, but is, uh, uh, as the ambassador was saying, to increase our strategic cooperation with the region? Uh, I think we have to understand, you know, these developments in certain context. And the context is that India has entered the new uh, strategic uh, arena, the space, uh, where I think the expectation from India was very high and it wasn't happening till then. Uh, and if even if you look at number of MOUs that we've signed, first thing, we have uh, taken a call that our Gulf partners are in real sense our strategic partners, be it uh, security, maritime, defense cooperation. But defense cooperation, I would like to make one point very clear. It would be minus boots on ground. That is very clear. But I think uh, when we are talking about the trilateral partnerships where UAE, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, they are very clearly uh you know identified as a strategic partners in the gulf but this is not to deny the fact that you know uh, the other uh, gulf partners are not important but since you raised the issue of the uh, defense cooperation will we be doing but i do feel uh, in future uh, i mean israel the abraham accord as we see so there are new opportunities opening up for india whether we're talking about economic cooperation or we're talking about defense cooperation. With Russia, we have, you know, again, you know, uh, uh, enhanced our cooperation, you know, and I, I personally feel that we have to wait, but I'm sure in years to come, this would not be a remote possibility. Uh, space security is one where, you know, they are very keen uh, to cooperate with us. There are new, uh, you know, areas like FinTech, so I'm sure that in years to come, our strategic defense partnership is going to enhance. It is going to take new uh, shapes. And uh, even the countries in the Gulf, they are looking at India, you know, uh, for a balanced uh, policy, I would say, you know, that they want to retain. There's also this fear. Uh, I'm not saying that anybody is going to replace the United States, but at the same time, given India's close partnership with Russia and United States, there are many avenues uh, which would be opening up for India. And I'm sure, uh, you know, things are going to move forward when we are talking about uh, these, uh, you know, trilateral, uh, quadrilateral, you know, cooperation. Uh, but, uh, but of course, minus boots on ground, as I said, that may not. Uh, maritime, uh, you know, collaboration would be the second uh, important dimension uh, which would be the future area. Uh, I mean, it is existing. And also, if we look at our Indo-Pacific, you know, uh, sort of contours, so uh, the, the Bahrain and, you know, Oman and, you know, those uh, countries are becoming important for us. So I think, uh, you know, there are uh, many dimensions to our strategic partnership that we are looking at uh, here. Many dimensions, um, that's a, a maritime Dr. Roy is uh, mentioning now uh, the UAE is currently the chair of uh, Aura, if I'm not mistaken, and there's going to be a virtual meeting of the Council of Ministers soon. The uh, newly elected Seychelles president is traveling on a second visit abroad to the UAE after Mauritius. But just coming back to India and the region now, multidimensional, as Dr. Roy pointed out, but till a while back, it would be looked at only in terms of, uh, say, oil and uh, natural gas imports from there and uh, exports of Indian workers and remittances. It's changed a whole lot uh, since then to look at uh, how the region is looking at life beyond oil as well. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, the economic dimension of the relationship is sometimes uh, uh, forgotten. Um, and let me just give you two perspectives on that. One is trade and the other is investment. Uh, in terms of uh, bilateral trade, Many of us don't realize uh, that United Arab Emirates is our third largest trading partner after the US and China, um, upwards of $60 billion in, in bilateral trade. Our trade with the GCC put together makes it our largest trading partner. 
um, larger than the EU. EU. Uh, and again, people don't realize how large that is uh, in terms of our bilateral uh, trading relationship. Um, for us, the second largest destination of our export, $32 billion after the US is UAE. Uh, larger than France, larger than Germany, larger than UK or Japan. Uh, so that's the size of the trading relationship. Um, when you look at the investment side, these are capital rich countries. Uh, and, 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 and the vast reserves of capital that they have, take again UAE as an example, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority has assets of, of upwards of $900 billion. Uh, their second uh, sovereign fund, Mubadla, has assets of $230, $240 billion. And then there are others. Uh, and, and then you replicate that across the uh, uh, other, other countries. And, and that is capital looking for safe and remunerative places to invest. It is the kind of long-term patient capital that Indian infrastructure uh, requires. Uh, and one of our successes over the last few years has been in persuading the sovereign funds to shed their traditional um, uh, re re reluctance uh, and really to take the plunge uh, in investments into a number of sectors uh, from renewable energy to highways to ports and so on. Right, uh, Dr. Roy, just taking up from what the ambassador is saying, I mean, you know, in the, these uh, high level visits that have happened, uh, whether it's the Saudis or the, uh, the Emiratis, we hear of these double digit uh, investment plans, uh, multi billion double digit. Uh, does the Indian economy have the capacity to, uh, to uh, absorb them? Are we actually doing enough? I think, you know, uh, while I'm a very uh, positive and hopeful person, but uh, I mean, in terms of delivery, if we see, I would say, you know, uh, let us not forget that, you know, certain, uh, you know, conversation that I've had with the business community in, in these areas, you know, they find India as a very good market. They find India as a place of opportunity. And now with certain reforms which are taking place, you know, uh, within our country, they do offer. But I think there is much more that we need to do. Uh, you know, uh, it is it is something that there is a promised uh, deal with us, and I'm sure it will fructify in years to come. But uh, so far, we have to have a very cautious uh, plan. You know, it is it's uh, it's it is. I would say that you know, I mean, when we say we need to provide that kind of an atmosphere, we need to provide that kind of an environment. And uh, the one where we can absorb, there are there are ample opportunities as we see, but there are bureaucratic hurdles, you know, I mean, those, I guess, need to be addressed, uh, uh, you know, when you talk to them. But for now, I think uh, I would I would say that be it infrastructure, railways, uh, oil uh, sector, you know, uh, renewable, uh, you name a sector, you know, Ambassador Suri has highlighted the numbers and all. But I would say that, you know, we need to go a little faster on this. Let's not disappoint our Gulf partners, you know, uh, with our bureaucratic hurdles. Let's not, you know, create a situation where they are willing to, uh, to, to invest and we are not ready to take it. I think that's where the, the cautious element that I would like to say. I'm sure uh, he is the, he's the man who's been... Uh, probably implementing the policies. We are the ones who normally provide options and, you know, uh, create a kind of a situation where the things move faster. So we are a little alarmist also in our approach as a academic people. But, uh, you know, I, 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 would, uh, I, would, I would like to say, you know, sometimes when you talk to the business people, they say, you know, there is a lot of bureaucratic hurdles, you know, we need to, we don't get access, we don't, we need... Uh, lot of areas where India needs to uh, move faster than us. So I hope those, uh, sure. because I'm not, uh, I'm not, I have no access to uh, the track one, uh, you know, uh, debates and all, but uh, with my, uh, you know, uh, interactions with people, but every, every uh, Gulf partner that we know of is willing to work and, uh, you know, is willing to work with us in every sector. That's what I would say. It is, let, let it me, is on, let, let let is on us. The, uh, the ambassador. ambassador, I can see you smiling there and you have a lot to say. Well, yeah, um, I thought uh, since uh, Dr. Meena, the academic is being so diplomatic, let the diplomat become a little undiplomatic and, okay. and, and 
and laid out straight. Um, you know, there's no question that we've made vast improvements in the ease of doing business. But there is also a fact that because of the complications in our systems, uh, both in terms of rules and in the enforcement of rules, uh, and in the judicial system that is uh, involved in litigating on those, um, we uh, cause a lot of uh, pain and heartburn to friendly countries that are interested in investing. I will give you three specific examples. Um, during my term in Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia's Aramco and the UAE's Adnoc signed a very famous agreement to invest 50%, that's $25 billion, in a $50 billion grassroots mega refinery project in Maharashtra. Um, but it got so embroiled in local politics that even the land acquisition couldn't begin hmm. years after the notification. Uh, now, people move on. They, they have other interests. They are not going to wait indefinitely for you. Number two, and I want to be very nonpartisan about it. Um, UAE's sovereign fund, RDI, has major investments in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, quite a few of those projects happen to be in Andhra, which was very progressive in terms of embrace of renewable energy. You have a change in government, and suddenly the old power purchase agreements are uh, put on hold. What does that do to an infrastructure investment that typically has a 30-year horizon? People have put the money up front. Uh, based on stability of laws. Example number three, again, the sovereign fund sees a huge opportunity in India's aviation sector. It puts in a serious bid for Mumbai airport. They put $700 million in an escrow account to show their seriousness about their bid. And then an Indian company comes and elbows out the uh, uh, people who have been sitting there and they are left with this aftertaste that is this really a level playing field, right? So each example uh, kind of points the spotlight on what's wrong with our system and why we are in a two steps forward, one step back situation. Uh, uh, and, and, and why, despite having all the right parameters, including enthusiasm from the investors, um, our capacity to frustrate them remains undiminished. Undiminished. Uh, Dr. Rai, just uh, uh, talk about you. You mentioned the Abraham Accords. Uh, how do you see, you know, what, what the change that's happening? And now it's uh, even Morocco that has uh, uh, agreed to normalize ties with Israel. So UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, uh, I beg your pardon, Sudan. And uh, talk about the meeting that never happened between MBS and Netanyahu. How do you see uh, that dynamics and it affecting India in either positive or negative? I think uh, Abraham Accord, you know, from India's point of view, is a positive development. Mm. Uh, I don't see uh, mm. negative developments. Yeah, you know, our uh, our policy towards the Palestinian issue remains the same. Uh, we haven't changed any, uh, you know, course on that. So Abraham Accord, I would say, opens as in the beginning also I said. So from my point of view, this opens many new areas for us. So there would be competition and there would be cooperation as mm -hmm. well. You know, India and Israel, they are already uh, real strategic partners when we are talking about, uh, you know, the strategic partnerships that we've been using so loosely. Uh, you know, it's, it's a friend indeed, uh, but uh, it is also about doing business. So I think when we are talking about uh, the Abraham Accord, we need to look at the areas where, you know, India, UAE and Israel have a win-win situation. So from my point of view, there are a number of sectors, whether we're talking about fintech, whether we are talking about startups, whether we are talking about, you know, uh, many uh, space uh, security, uh, digital uh, digitization and digital platforms that can be used. So I think these are education, I would say, uh, these are the areas where, you know, uh, I think the, the there is a capacity. The, the countries like UAE, which have set up a new goals for themselves, you know, they want to 
to invest more in uh, their defense. They want to invest more in space. They want to invest more in terms of tourism, uh, medical uh, arena. I think the huge number of uh, uh, you know areas and the opportunities which are opening. So from my point of view, I think we need to probably sit uh, trilaterally and see what are the, they could be, you know, at track two level or uh, from the researcher's point of view, I would say one good policy paper could be uh, done uh, jointly, trilaterally, uh, you know, and, and, you know, what is doable, what is not doable. And I'm not saying just the academic people like us, but from uh, various areas, you know, from science and technology, from space. So you need very specific areas where you can zero down and then move forward on that. You know, the homework is very important. And that's where I would say for me, I think Abraham Accord from India's point of view is is a, is, is a opening of many new opportunities. Uh, Ambassador, opportunities, of course, opening, but uh, uh, competition versus cooperation, is it is it a, a versus there? I actually see synergies em emerging, uh, uh, particularly uh, given the fact that Israel and the UAE are our two closest partners in the Middle East. Uh, the fact that they have uh, moved forward so rapidly uh, to normalize relations. And, you know, I'm uh, reminded of the fact that my first assignment uh, as an Arabic language uh, trainee in Cairo uh, was not too long after the Camp David Accord Accords. Uh, and uh, uh, my second assignment was 25 years later as ambassador. And in those 25 years, very little had actually changed between Egypt and Israel. Um, uh, so uh, there was a peace, but it was a kind of a cold peace. Uh, the speed at which UAE and Israel have normalized uh, is real normalization. Uh, within the space of three months, uh, there are flights in place. There are delegations going back and forth. Uh, there's a visa-free travel agreement, uh, Israel's first with any Arab uh, country. Um, their investment and in technology it mission... Is serious that there are warnings because of uh, Iran, uh, attacks that possibly Iran would instigate against Israeli tourists or Israeli travelers to well, the US. You know, that itself. I, I, I think, look, while the Iranian dimension is always there uh, in, in, in this uh, relationship, I wouldn't exaggerate uh, the importance no, of that. The, 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 the synergy between is Israel and the UAE. I was just referring to that. Sure, sure, sure. And, and that is definitely a dimension. But what I want to say is that UAE had embarked on a certain course. Um, and and you know, what you, what's interesting for me is the lengths to which they are going to separate uh, the political issues about Israel from problems that you might have with the Jewish faith. Uh, and, you know, for countries that have uh, been uh, reared on a diet of anti-Semitism, yeah. uh, for them to make this shift, to actually have a rabbi in Dubai today, to have a kosher restaurant in Bur Burj Khalifa, um, shows, uh, you know, to talk about this house of the Abraham family in Abu Dhabi, where you'll have a synagogue, a mosque, and a church in the same compound, tells you how far... Uh, uh, some countries are moving in terms of uh, establishing a very different uh, brand and a very different uh, uh, perspective on uh, Islam and how it uh, perceived, how it behaves towards other religions. Uh, and I think that's significant. And you can see that part, that dimension uh, emerging quite strongly in terms of the normalization with Israel. Egypt hasn't dared to do that, for example. Uh, you know, uh, um, you know that it's been 35 years since the agreements were signed. Uh, Dr. Roy, I mean, the, the meeting that never took place on the Red Sea uh, between Netanyahu and MBS, uh, how do you see, one, that, two, uh, the uh, assassination, the killing of uh, Fakhrid Zay, and the Biden administration, I mean, they're all connected. And how do you, you see India responding? I mean, seen Prime Minister Modi's uh, trip to Saudi Arabia as well, 2019 uh, and the Saudi uh, trip here. How do you see that playing out? Uh, well, I would say, you know, uh, as far as the US policy in the region is concerned, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, there are certain perceptions and uh, the reality when it comes to the uh, actual, uh, you know, sort of uh, delivery, uh, you know, one needs to see those uh, differences as well. 
I mean, I've been hearing that the Americans would attack Iran, but that never happened, you see. So I, in, in an era when everybody is, and let's not forget, you know, COVID-19, you know, uh, each country is going through uh, a lot of churning process when we are talking about the socio-political dimensions there. Uh, whether it is Gulf or, uh, you know, the larger, you know, Middle East that we say, the West Asia, North Africa, or even the country like superpower like United States, the focus is more on the internal dimension of it. So while the killing of Suleimani, I mean, these, these are, uh, you know, I think as far as the Trump administration was concerned, the focus was too much on Iran. And I think what, what uh, President Trump said, he wanted to prove that. And it continues even today. Uh, whether there would be war against, uh, you know, Iran, I doubt, uh, you know, nobody wants. And, and uh, more so, I would say, when we're talking about the Biden administration, they they would have some, uh, probably they would introduce some kind of a changes as far as Iran is concerned. I'm not expecting uh, a major sort of change. And, you know, as far as the, the nuclear deal is concerned, you know, what we are hearing and what we are, you know, the narrative that we see. Uh, but I do expect some changes when it comes to the uh, Iranian uh, issue. And again, as an Indian, I think uh, if there are some, uh, you know, softening of uh, situation between United States and uh, Iran, that benefits us. And here, you know, I'm I'm coming to the connectivity aspect of uh, our, whether we're talking about Chabahar, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, larger, you know, India's connectivity with Eurasia. So uh, I am not going to read too much into it. Israel, I think uh, they would try because for them, Iran is a real challenge and a threat. And as far as the Iranians are concerned, one common thing that I have observed is there, you know, uh, hatred for the Israeli policies? Uh, this is, this is uh, across the uh, sort of whether you talk to the youth, whether you talk to the any uh, normal business person, and of course the regime as such. So that dimension is, I don't think it is going to change that fast. So that that yeah yeah, yeah. sure. Ambassador, uh, what's expected from uh, the Biden administration in terms of uh, trying to get uh, the Iranians back into some form of a JCPOA uh, or how they deal with Iran and how that uh, affects India and, and the Saudis, are they going to be left out, especially because of Khashoggi and the human rights issues with uh, uh, the Americans coming to the forefront again? You know, um, West Asia generally defies any kind of crystal ball gazing um, uh, because there are so many moving parts uh, and, and, and we are seeing parts moving as we speak. Um, there is the fact that the Biden uh, uh, agenda, as uh, declared by them, uh, includes trying to uh, get JCPOA back on track. Um, nothing surprising about that. But then you have a, a googly in the form of uh, Fakhrizadeh's assassination. Uh, and, 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 and then that demands a reaction. It strengthens the position of the hardliners in uh, uh, Tehran. It weakens uh, those who would have wanted the JCPOA to come back on track. Uh, and then you try and figure out who has an interest in, in doing this. Meanwhile, in other moving parts, um, Kushner was in uh, uh, the Gulf last week. Um, he went to Riyadh. And uh, now we are hearing uh, reports of a possible thaw uh, in the relations with Qatar. Uh, and, 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 and again, uh, you know, a, a new dynamic. Uh, one of the things that the Trump administration has been uh, really keen on is to try and uh, um, break the deadlock so that all the ducks can be lined up against Iran rather than against facing each other. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, they didn't have a lot of success uh, in that over the last uh, uh, two and a half, three years. Uh, but uh, if towards the end of the uh, uh, administration, uh, they can have that swan song, that, that would be, again, something quite interesting to watch. 
Um, I think that the um, uh, the fact that uh, all of these changes are taking place, I think what the Trump administration has taught the uh, our friends in the Gulf is you cannot rely on the Americans. Uh, they actually had a very hard line view on Obama. Uh, uh, they felt that Obama had sold them down the river uh, by signing an agreement uh, with Iran without uh, any consent or consultation um, with states that were in the neighborhood, and that the agreement focused exclusively on the nuclear aspects of the problem and ignored what they see as Iran's malign interference uh, in the region. Uh, so they were very miffed with Obama. Uh, and then, you know, uh, with the mood swings of uh, Trump, uh, they were again watching which way is this uh, is this going to go. Uh, so I think they are now uh, quite firmly of the view that they need to hedge their bets. Uh, and, and in that hedging of bets and in terms of uh, opening up their strategic options, India is an interesting option uh, for them. That here's a country which is large, which is stable, which is reasonably predictable in its uh, behavior. It is... Uh, uh, and it is seen as a force of stability in the in the in, in the region. Uh, so so uh, you know you can see all of these things uh, churning. Uh, and I think uh, you know we uh, are showing our own deftness. Uh, we are showing that we are watching the uh, uh, developments and responding uh, with agility. Uh, whether you look at Prime Minister's phone call uh, with the Emir of Qatar uh, or the forthcoming uh, visit of the External Affairs Minister. Uh, or indeed uh, some of the other. So we are again saying that we are not in an either or position in the quartet. You guys make peace amongst yourself. That's great. We will work with each of you. If you're not in an either or, and we've done that successfully with the with countries on you know different sides of the divide, Dr. Roy, but say uh, crystal ball, as the master is saying, is very difficult in, in the region. But if... Uh, sanctions, your sanctions on, say, Iran, uh, or especially when it comes to, say, Chabahar, which has already got uh, a waiver, but they are diluted to the extent that India um, is allowed to deal more uh, and, and our business is allowed to uh, deal more with Iran. How do you see that working in terms of India's positioning with sworn enemies of Iran in the region? Uh, I think, you know, when we talk about uh, India, Iran uh, versus our uh, Gulf partners, uh, there's, there's very clear, uh, you know, sort of uh, on ground reality that our stakes are higher in the Gulf. But does that mean we can ignore Iran? The answer is no, absolutely no. And that is the reason why, despite sanctions, despite the, uh, our closeness with the United States of America, we did move forward on Iran. But if we try to see the, the actual substance, whether we're talking about the economic cooperation, we do have uh, you know, taken a call that because of the sanctions, we will stop buying oil from Iran. Iran was not very happy with India, but we are uh, you know looking at the practical dimension the strategic dimension that what is beneficial for india what are our national interest and how do we manage our relations with iran but if you see the recent visits also by defense minister even if you know uh, it was a stopover but we are constantly giving a signal that iran matters to us even on chabahar if you see the recent developments they may have been slow and connectivity projects, especially, you know, I call them the, uh, you know, new uh, integration game today that everybody is playing. Whether it's BRI, there is a geopolitical dimension to it. There's a geoeconomic dimension to it. But when we are looking at, you know, India's uh, connectivity projects, we are trying to see how best, you know, we can uh, chip in where, you know, it is the win-win situation. It is the, the capacity building that we are looking at. It is also, you know, Afghanistan is a factor when we are talking about Iran. Uh, Central Asia is a factor that we are talking about, uh, you know, Iran. So uh, things might change in due course uh, as and when 
you know, uh, things ease out between uh, U.S. and Iran. But as far as the regime, the Iranian regime is concerned, uh, Ambassador Suri really pointed out that the hardliners have are becoming stronger. Uh, whether it was uh, Soleimani's killing and later this nuclear scientist killing, so these are and and also you know the way the if you if you hear the Vilayat Fakir the supreme leader statements, you know, uh, you know. We need to communicate, and we have communicated uh, with the Iranians that there are certain sensitive issues where you know Iran has to understand India, and similarly, you know, you know, India would take that into account. But sure. each nation will look at its national interest. So Iran, I think India will continue to 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 stay engaged with Iran, whether we're talking about Chaba, whether we talk about trade and commerce. So there are various options that we are trying to work out. Uh, but, uh, you know, you cannot sacrifice your, uh, you know, uh, hard core or core uh, strategic interest, your trade investments, uh, you know, your diaspora. These are the issues that no country would like to compromise on. Uh, Master, a quick uh, response from both of you. Of course, you, you talked about how everybody's looking at hedging their bets in the region. Uh, and India is a good option to you put your money in, so as to speak. Uh, what about China? I mean, China uh, has huge inroads in the area. There are reports of that $400 billion deal over 25 years with Iran, which, of course, we know is not uh, fructified or it's not been formalized. But uh, China, is, is that a, a, a competition for India in the region? I think China is a competition for everybody in all regions, <laughs> as a general <laughs> accurate statement of fact. Uh, uh, and, and the Gulf is no uh, exception to that. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, they traditionally had a fairly low profile in um, in, in this part of the world. Uh, but over the last few years, they have made uh, very major investments, not just with, in Iran, uh, but if you move further to Egypt, uh, in the Suez Canal economic zone, in the uh, port of Alexandria, and, 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 and Port Said, and so on. Um, they're trying to connect it with their ambitious program. Uh, look at what they've done in Djibouti, where they've actually elbowed out uh, DP word of Dubai and uh, muscled into the port, uh, you know, uh, like it or not. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, there are patterns to Chinese uh, behavior. Um, some uh, which are welcomed because they bring in hard investment, they bring in hard infrastructure. And a country like Egypt uh, accepts that with eyes wide open. Um, and then there are uh, concerns about their uh, their practices. Uh, and and uh, those concerns are legitimate. And uh, people are watching very carefully. But I don't think you find any, you know, it's the new game in town. And everybody wants to uh, be, make sure that they are uh, part of that game. And uh, so the, the wooing of China is... Uh, is underway, but usually I find two things. Uh, one is, it is with all the caveats that China comes with. And people are particularly given the behavior of China during COVID, post COVID, all of the uh, naked aggression over the last few months. I think it's it's worrisome for people. Um, and, and the second is, you know, uh, all said and done, there's a certain emotional connect with India. Um, there's a historical connect with India. Uh, we do have uh, assets and advantages, and I think we should play to our advantage rather than get uh, uh, sort of stampeded into uh, doing what China is doing. Their game is different. We should be there for the long game ourselves. Uh, this is our backyard. Uh, and, and the fact is that after 20 years of a look east policy, we finally now seem to be having a look west policy, which was badly needed and overdue. Uh, Dr. Roy, if you want to take the final comments on uh, China in terms of the caveats, uh, yeah. uh, there's the regions moving in there with its eyes wide open and how does India fit in? I think, you know, as uh, Ambassador Suri said, you know, let us build on our own strengths. Let us build on what uh, is expected from us and what we can deliver. China, you know, I mean, I would like to give one example of Uzbekistan here. So this is what the, even the Gulf region has to uh, to learn. They were very smart. You know, the first uh, bullet train, the fast speed train uh, from uh, Tashkent to Fargana was built by the Chinese. But the deal which the Uzbeks said, 
you are going to train our people our managers you know we are not accepting your labor which is going to come and do it and the other project they gave it to the spanish company so this is how diversification and gaining maximum economic uh, benefit and where china can deliver and others can't that's how smart the gulf countries will have to be and i think they have they are learning it right way but as uh, you know ambassador suri said there is a connect and that connect and the bond uh, which is there between india and the west asian countries the west asian and i would go to to in fact morocco tunisia egypt he's been in egypt and i have personally experienced uh, the love for indians so it is it is in central asia in west asia and even in north africa i would say in morocco uh, mm -hmm. you have that you know uh, that bond and the connect and i think we need to uh, you know fully uh, you know use this yeah, advantage right. before it goes away and particularly uh, one last point i would say is about youth uh, the education and the media you know you mm -hmm. people need to go more to the you know region we don't have people reporting from the region so i think you know when we are already in act west asia uh period the the era is that about acting more swiftly in west asian region the media people should be there positioned in bahrain in uh, you know uh, kuwait oman greater you know interaction between the youths here and there i i think is required we need uh, you know a more interaction more media uh, debates not only in india but from the region with india here to there and i think i'll stop here your point is absolutely well taken since you started off by saying uzbekistan interesting to see now that uzbekistan today has in fact proposed a trilateral with uh, iran and afghanistan, afghanistan. iran uh, activity yeah. that's uh, exactly really interesting. Uh, Dr. Roy, thank you again for your time and your experience. It uh, was a pleasure having you on Strat News Global. Sure, pleasure is mine. Thanks. And uh, Master, of course, uh, you, you're well known all across India and the region. And thanks again for appearing on Strat News. Thank you for your time as well, Master. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Just a reminder to our viewers that if you like our kind of journalism, you can support us by going on our website to also follow our. Social media handles on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You've been watching a Talking Point with Ambassador uh, Navdeep Singh Suri and Dr. Meena Singh Roy. I'm Amitabh Reddy.